Midway was no stranger to the arcades, especially when it came to racing games. Hydro Thunder, San Francisco Rush, the Cruisin' Series, and California Speed are just a few of the titles that pop into my head when I think of the former developer slash publisher. In 1997, Off-Road Challenge would hit arcades, a venture that was led by one of Midway's lead programmers, Mike Hunley. But this wasn't the first game in the series, as Off-Road Challenge was a sequel in the line of Super Off-Road titles which started in the arcades with 1989's Ivan Iron Man Stewart's Super Off-Road. Utilizing a top-down full view of each track, a style popularized previously by games like Super Sprint, this one quickly gained popularity and was ported to just about every home console at the time, including the Amiga, Commodore 64, MS-DOS, ZX Spectrum, Master System, Genesis, NES, and SNES, as well as a few others, though some versions did not feature the Ivan Stewart endorsement. The series would evolve with the 1993 Super Nintendo release of Super Off-Road The Baja, which abandoned the top-down perspective in favor of a third-person view which was becoming more commonplace in racing games during the time. A Genesis version of the game was planned but scrapped before release. Fast forward a few years to the era of the Nintendo 64 and many of the recent Midway arcade titles were making their way to the powerful home console and Off-Road Challenge would be no exception. All right, son, here's what we got. Your suspension's all boogered up. You got what appears to be antlers lodged in your transact. You busted your U-joint. And God only knows how this got stuck in your flywheel. Oh, and um, you left brake lights out. This thing has brakes? Off-Road Challenge, Midway's arcade hit now on Nintendo 64. It's a license to drive like crazy. Out of the way! So in June of 1998, the game would hit store shelves, but not without its fair share of criticism. Why, you ask? Well, let's take a closer look. This is Off-Road Challenge for the Nintendo 64. While the arcade version was developed in-house by Midway, the N64 port would be handed down to Avalanche Software, who had previously handled the PlayStation version of Mortal Kombat Trilogy and was working on the upcoming Nintendo 64 release of Rampage 2 Universal Tour. The company would go on to work on the TAC series and more recently Cars 2 and Cars 3. The team wasn't given much time to port the arcade title over to the 64-bit unit with just under a year to do so. This would lead to many of the shortcomings that critics would point out as to reasons why the game wasn't very good, but we'll get to that in a bit. One of the first things you'll notice is that the arcade menus were recycled for this version, similar to what we saw with Cruisin' USA. They even left in the steering wheel and pedal icons for selections. Typically, other Midway home ports from the time received unique menus such as Rush, Cruisin' World, California Speed, you get my drift. This could have been a time constraint issue, but regardless on whether that's true or not, I have no problem with the reusing of arcade assets, though IGN wasn't too happy about it for some reason. If you'd like to jump straight into the action, you can select Just Play, which is the equivalent of the arcade mode. But exclusive here to the N64 version is the Circuit Mode, which consists of a series of races not unlike many other racers from the era. While it may seem there are only four trucks to choose from, four more are hidden behind these C buttons, not unlike the hidden vehicles from Cruisin' USA. Each of these vehicles feature their own unique attributes, meaning there should be at least a little strategy behind your selection. The star of the game, Toyota Trophy, features superior acceleration but is rather light. Class 10 Heavy Metal is one of the most well-rounded selections. Baja Buggy is extremely quick but its lightweight can become an issue on certain tracks. Class 8 Mini Metal is another option that features good speed at the expense of being a featherweight. Toyota 4x4 Monster is obviously heavy but handling can be quite difficult. The Crusher is another heavyweight with poor handling. The Punisher is also quite the Bertha, but handles better than the previous two options. And Thunderbolt features possibly the best overall handling and weight combination in the game, 
the latter of which decreases the possibility of being knocked around the track by opponents. But ultimately, it's really up to the individual player to decide, and one should find the vehicle that works for them pretty quickly. There are six tracks to select from initially, with three more that can be unlocked, taking you from locations like the Mojave Desert and Las Vegas to Baja, Guadalupe, and in between. Each track is filled with unique landscapes like snow, mud, dirt, sand, and pavement. You'll go head-on with pedestrian vehicles, see beautiful sunsets, come across road hazards to avoid, and witness bizarre happenings along the way like freaking UFOs racing above your head. It's all very chaotic and, as an arcade racer, should be. Now let's talk about vehicle upgrades. This is something that dates back to the roots of the series and can definitely assist in gaining the advantage for your upcoming race. Upgrading the shocks will help with vehicle slowdown that typically occurs after jumps. Tires increase handling, which is a vital upgrade as the difficulty levels increase along the series. Vehicles will begin each race with two nitros, but more can be purchased as needed. And upgrading a vehicle's speed and acceleration increases their jumping height. No, just kidding. It improves speed and acceleration. So how the heck does the game play? Well, if you can't tell by looking at it, the best way I can describe it is cruising USA with off-road vehicles. The button layout is simple enough with A used for acceleration, B for brake, and Z used for turbos. R and C down are reserved for shifting if playing in manual mode, while left C changes music and right C the view. Handling is very responsive and tight in most terrains, but some will cause your vehicle to drift around quite a bit, so races tend to offer some variety in that aspect. You'll face off against seven opponents, with early circuit races only requiring fourth place or better to advance, but by the master circuit, you'll need to place first in each race to progress, which can become quite the task, as this game ramps up in difficulty pretty quickly. Obstacles become harder to avoid, tracks can feel cluttered during more narrow portions, with opponents often nearby, and turns become sharper and more frequent. And with this one being a checkpoint racer, it's also quite possible to run out of time, so the unlimited retries are much appreciated here. As is the Nitro system, because these can come in handy, especially during those final stretches of a race where overtaking other drivers becomes vital. Cash is earned for the top four rankings in each race, which can be in turn spent on the previously mentioned upgrades, which are an absolute necessity for most players. Pickups are scattered across each course. Along the way, you'll come across crash helmets that temporarily keep you from losing speed after colliding with another driver. Blue nitro bottles add one nitro to your inventory, while red bottles make your next nitro more powerful. You'll only come across one of these red bottles for each track, so make sure to keep a good eye out. If you happen to pick up a treasure chest, you'll be awarded an extra 40,000 to spend on upgrades. And if these upgrades aren't enough, you can also gain a slight advantage by performing a starting line boost, which is done by perfectly timing the gas with the go command. They also included a split screen multiplayer mode, but sadly on a console that features four controller ports, it's limited to only two players. Still, it's a nice addition as multiplayer was a must have for any racing game during this time. Overall, the gameplay is far from polished and definitely has some flaws, but it's still very enjoyable for those arcade racing junkies out there, such as myself. Maybe not so enjoyable would be the visuals, because this is where critics really tore this game apart. Now, my judgment was always a bit clouded, as I was a Mega N64 fan, so I never really had any complaints about the visuals here. But I will admit that the frame rate isn't the best, and the lack of the usual Nintendo 64 fog used to mask the hardware's draw distance issues isn't present here, leading to quite the amount of pop-in. Also criticized was the mix of the 3D polygons with 2D sprites, but in all fairness, this look was used quite commonly during the time, and honestly, I've always been a fan of this presentation style. The on-screen HUD has a very midway feel to it, 
The vehicles are colorful and detailed, and the stages all feature plenty of characteristics that make them stand out amongst each other. Music for the game was composed by Rob Adesalp, whose name I probably just butchered. He had previously provided work on games like Double Dragon 5, The Shadow Falls, Troy Aikman NFL Football, and the PS1 versions of Rampage World Tour and Mortal Kombat 3, amongst others. The selection here ranges from generic rock music to stereotypical rock and roll, but this wasn't outside of the norm for the time frame, and while none of the tracks really stand out as something you'll be humming throughout your day, it all fits the fast-paced arcade action quite well. Sound effects are also very arcade, with thundering engine sounds, in-game announcers demanding you make selections, and you can't forget Mr. Checkpoint Guy. Checkpoint! Despite the low console rating from critics like IGN's 2.5 out of 10, the series would continue to thrive in the arcades with the 1999 follow-up release of Opera Thunder, which was also a part of the Thunder series of Midway games alongside Hydro Thunder, Four Wheel Thunder, and Arctic Thunder, but not WCW Thunder. That's, that's something else altogether. This one would ditch the cruising like gameplay in favor for a high-flying, drift-heavy mechanic, which felt quite different than Off-Road Challenge, and unfortunately for us fans of the franchise, this is where things would come to an end for the Off-Road games. This was a special time in my life. My N64 got me through a lot of hard times, and racing games were my escape. These Midway titles that I enjoyed in the arcades had hit my favorite console, and I was extremely thankful. This one may not have hit home with an impact for many, but it was a major part of my adolescence, and I guess that's why I still have such a great appreciation for it. How many of you out there grew up with this one? I'd love to hear your experiences. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope that everybody's doing well, and I hope to see you back here for the next one.